Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Our gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every one of our hearts be ever acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There's plenty to follow in the news, isn't there? A week and a half ago, the Capitol was overrun by a mob of people seeking to disrupt a free and fair election whose results they did not like. They were out to subvert democracy itself. Four days ago, the president was impeached for a second time, in this instance, for inciting that insurrection at the Capitol. Three days from now, a new president and vice president will be inaugurated, and not only is Washington on high alert and filled with soldiers, but state capitals and municipalities all over the country are as well. We were all shaken by the violence and desecration we witnessed on January 6th, and we know from the things they post that the people who perpetrated those disgusting actions are planning for more. In the middle of all this comes Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and I wonder what steadying, clarifying, and convicting influence that might have on us. I'll admit that I've thought since January 6th of how glad I am that some of the people I've known or known of who have most believed in American democracy were not alive to see that travesty. I've thought of my own dad, and I've thought of Dr. King. It seems like the unfolding years since King's death only bring new information about unfortunate choices he made in his life, and which may have an explanation but certainly no excuse, such as plagiarism or infidelity. But his public contributions to our republic have been seminal, and he will always be a great American. King was a great American, not because he outdid himself in flag waving or in whatever passes for patriotism, not because he affirmed his government's actions no matter what it said or did, not because he told other people they could love it or leave it, but because he so believed in the project of America and he spent his life living out that belief. He believed that it is simply self-evident that all men, and we now affirm all humans, are created equal, and that all the constructed categories we make to call people different from each other can never take away from this. He knew that it's one thing to say that all people are equal and another to enact laws that put these words into practice. He knew that his country could be no more learned healthy and successful than the very least valued or capable of its members. He knew that no one is free until every last person is free, and he understood so expansively how it is that we imprison each other. Discrimination and prejudice, bigotry, poverty, elitism, undereducating, marginalization, threats of violence, sometimes subtle, sometimes as on January 6th, outright murderous. Dr. King knew that the project of America is accessible to all people, whether they claim a religious or spiritual tradition or if they abstain altogether from that. In the end, the project is about the inestimable value placed on every human being simply because they are human we are not the only country with a noble vision, and we certainly have failed in our project so many times. King was a great American because he helped us keep our eyes on our prize. The greatest Americans are often America's greatest critics. Homegrown criticism has been itself criticized, particularly harshly in recent years, but it is a proud American tradition. 
My old minister, William Sloan Coffin, used to preach not just the virtues but the responsibilities of being, as he called it, the loyal opposition. If the emperor is buck naked, say so. If the country we love is getting something wrong, say so. The alternative is to stick our heads in the sand and say, well, maybe things will be better when I come up for air, rather than embracing a responsibility as a citizen to keep our very wonderful, very flawed country on track. What we saw on January 6th was a perversion of the work of loyal opposition. And it is up to all of us who were disgusted by what we saw on display that day to show, as did King, what it means truly to call our society to account. I think Dr. King was a particularly great American because he had choices before him, and he chose the difficult but right path. He writes in his Birmingham jail letter, mind you, to white clergy, about middle-class blacks who in certain ways benefit from segregation and who are economically insulated enough not to have to participate in the civil rights movement. Dr. King was absolutely a member of that group. He had academic credentials, professional legitimacy, financial stability, and social standing within the black community anyway, and arguably didn't have to get involved. In the Birmingham jail letter, as in his I Have a Dream speech and so many others, it is his experience particularly as a parent and his compassion for his fellow humans that makes him take action. And it is the very principle of justice based on his religious view that is messianic and eschatological. I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and member of the resistance who was executed by the Nazis in the very last weeks of the Second World War. He too could have sat out that conflagration. He was elite and he had friends in the US and UK who wanted to give him safe haven during the war, but he couldn't. The example of King and Bonhoeffer, I believe, asks each of us what struggles for justice we might be insulated from, even as they claim our societies, and which our faith or conscience still compels us to participate in. Many of us, starting with me, are not among the threatened or very desperate, not now. Dr. King did this in a way. He earned a name for his efforts for racial equality, but he then expanded his mission to include the end of poverty for all, and then the end of the Vietnam War. Some of his closest advisors begged him not to expand his critique. They told him that a black man could barely get away with calling for racial justice. If he were to take on other economic and militaristic structures, he would be a marked man for sure. Arguably, they were right. One year to the day after King gave a speech called On Vietnam at Riverside Church in New York, he was assassinated. In that speech, he made the profound connections between racial discrimination, economic disparity, and the perpetuation of the war in Vietnam. He showed their interconnection. The moment is very ripe for each of us to investigate the interconnection of what our privileges and what our social locations mean in the crises we are living through now. Crises of democracy, of racial injustice, of the pandemic, of economic disparity and desperation. The attack on the Capitol last week was literally white supremacy and white nationalism on parade with a gallows and noose set up, misogyny and anti-Semitism on proud display, Christian nationalism evinced in the many crosses that were erected there to say that God and Christ and the global church bless and endorse the violence, the hatred, the anarchy. So much of the rhetoric of the capital's invaders is in opposition to elites, and yet we learn that members of the crowd were lawmakers, 
corporation officers, the children of judges, and others who enjoy status and or real power. What is very true is that policies regarding taxes, wages, unions, education funding, global manufacturing, and other issues have truly left many Americans in a precarious position. What is not true is that these things are the fault of people of color or immigrants. Deaths of despair remain tragically on the rise. The democratic project of every one of us is to turn the outrage expressed by insurrectionists on January 6th into energy that will strengthen our society. There is so much that is unfair, unjust, and there will always be liars with megaphones ready to exploit people's humiliation. I've said that I'm glad that King, who would have turned 92 tomorrow, didn't see the attack on democracy on January 6th. But there are other outcomes these days that would gladden his heart. The black man who now occupies his Atlanta pulpit just got elected a U.S. Senator from Georgia. The other new senator from that state is Jewish. This Wednesday, a black woman also of South Asian descent will be sworn in as Vice President of the United States. The leadership of three people is not the answer to our problems as a nation, but the triumph of their elections over racism and anti-Semitism should give us hope for the journey. American Christians have much work to do. The suturing of racist, misogynist, anti-democratic rhetoric to the gospel of Jesus Christ is something we obviously must struggle against in every instance. At the heart of King's work and also of the January 6th travesty is the issue of truth-telling versus lies. The truth of the gospel, of neighbor love, human equality, and social justice in a real lived realm of divine justice and love is our own battle cry and our calling. Amen.